This video is in dialogue with Sifu Freddy Lee. And it's also put out there for response from my fellow Todai. This is an extension of the discussion that's ongoing rega regarding the balance of structure and creativity in FMK as well as the future of the Kuhn in general. Um, I'm honored that Sifu has asked me to respond to some very important questions that might affect the planning of this coon for the future and I've um, taken these questions into consideration now for a couple of days and I think there's m much more uh, consideration to be taken but for the time being I want to give my most uh, immediate impressions, ideas, thoughts, and such. So, the underlying, the underlying question is one of balancing structure with creativity. How much structure is going to stifle creativity? How much creativity Do we want to foster in order to enable Todai to to better reach their human potential? And it's a really difficult. Um, It's a really difficult problem. I haven't seen a good balance in any martial arts school that I'm familiar with. This is also a question of how to strike this balance in such a way that the coon will be successful and sustainable long term. It's also a question of how to strike this balance in such a way that there may be a benefit to society and that modern Kung Fu might set the bar for the modernization, you know, for bringing Kung Fu modern. Um, myself, I think, you know, the last time there was a big movement toward the modernity of Kung Fu was in the late 60s, early 70s, in, the, in Bruce Lee's era, when there was the sudden expansion of appreciation of Kung Fu um, globally. And of course in this case when I'm saying Kung Fu I'm, I'm talking um, in some part about what's really uh, Wushu because that's the popular association of the word Kung Fu is with the, with the combat art. Um, but I think it's more than this. And what's come since that last big move 
toward a modernization of Kung Fu. Um, there have been further modernizations, but the, these other modernizations are not necessarily healthy modernizations. Um, they're kind of martial. On the one hand, you get you get martial um, practice factories that are that are like big business. Um, where they may lend some improvement to people's lives, but overall uh, you're not seeing you're not seeing those businesses make a positive impact on society. On the on the other side, another form of of um, an attempt at modernization that's gone bad has been to make the the combat practice turn the combat practice into a competitive sport uh, to feed further feed some of the aggressive competitive core values of the mainstream society that are not positive values. So how to build a kun that is going to represent something different and is going to represent it in a way that could have a positive impact on society. I think that's what some of these questions are are really about. So the first question, in my eyes, what makes the perfect kun? All of these questions are difficult and I don't think I have the answers to any of them. Like I said, I know there's a lot more thinking that needs to go into this. There's a lot more um, consideration that needs to be put toward this. But I have some, you know, some perspectives. I mean, I've been in in my life. I've been um, involved in four different kuns or dojos or schools and I've also surveyed others. Um, FMK would be make my fifth kun that I've been involved in. and. What makes a coon um, perfect? You know, that's really hard to say, but I I do know um, that out of those f now five that I've been involved with, there were two that I left um, eventually with no kind of attachments um, that I was just done with. Uh, the the and there were there there's one that I'm still involved with aside from FMK and there's another um, the the first practice that I was ever involved in um, I'm I'm still in communication with my teacher and that was you know that's been um, over 20 years since I was involved in that but I still I still communicate with my teacher so <clears throat> to me I guess one aspect of a perfect kun is going to be 
the degree of relationality, the degree of the sense of belonging, the degree of the sense of family, the degree of the sense of fitting in with the kun. Um, in those that I dropped eventually after a couple of years of, of training in each of them, um, you know, a part of it was that I just physically had moved away from the area and so I couldn't train there. Uh, but I didn't stay in contact because there wasn't that strong relationality. And I don't know, you know, what my future would be like if there was that strong relationality in either of these schools that I'm talking about. Um, but I know from my experience that in a perfect kun, in a good kun, you will have strong relationships built. Um, you will have synergistic relationships built. And you will have that sense of family. Like for instance, the Gohakukai Dojo that I'm, I'm also involved with now at the same time that I'm involved with FMK, um, there is that sense of family that's long term where you know, I walked out for eight years uh, at first to do a grad, a graduate study, and then um, I just didn't get the motivation to go back. But I still stayed in contact um, with the people in the inner circle of that school, and I know um, Sifu, you've talked about this that that you've witnessed as well in every uh, kun there's kind of an inner circle and there's an the outer circle um, it's not that there's a that there should be a, a, a any kind of barrier between the two relational circles but really uh, what it comes down to is the outer circle are is is comprised of um, todai who've come in and they're and they haven't decided whether they're committed yet and whether they whether they feel like they fit there yet and that um, that can take some time it can also be fairly immediate it's like any other relationship you can have a love at first sight relationship or you can have a relationship that has to kind of grow on you um, But it is important that there's that there is that strong that strong relationality at the core, and you know to give an example of the kind of relationality I'm talking about. Um, first of all, it, it does feel like family, and So there is a there is a sense of having brothers and sisters. There is a sense of having a father and a sifu, and um, more than that, people people um, let down the walls of their privacy a bit in the inner circle where. Um, you know, if you if you're in the outer circle, people might not really know much about you, and you might not be re revealing much about yourself. You know, might not be talking much about your life. The only thing that um, that uh, you're involved with is the training at that particular you know at the sessions that you attend, um, and they know you in terms of your um, level of. Um, uh, ability and skills in that training and how you carry yourself in that training but they don't know you right they might not know um, you know anything about your personal life but in the inner circle you know some some about everybody's personal life and not only do you know something about everybody's personal life but you are able to 
um, use that inner circle as kind of a as kind of a corporate um, group, in a sense. And what I mean by that is, uh, I'll just give a, a quick example. Um, one time, I was unemployed, and um, another member of the he was kind of on the fringe of the inner circle wasn't quite totally in and wasn't quite totally out but uh, there was another student in the dojo and he was a manager of a fairly large company and so the sensei knowing that uh, I was unemployed told him why don't you hire Ryan um, because he's unemployed, he needs a job, and all of us here, we should be helping each other. So, um, that, that man hired me, and I worked at his company for a couple of years. Um, you know, these are the kind of things, if somebody has a certain skill um, outside of the martial arts training, um, that skill should be lent to the strength of the kun, right? So if somebody knows, um, if somebody's a, a really good mechanic, well then you know you can bring your, um, your mechanical issues to him and he'll help you. If someone's a doctor, medical doctor, you can bring some medical issues to him and he'll help you. Um, you know, and this is all the kind of, it's it's family, it's a family kind of help. It's not help for, help for monetary profit or anything like that. It's just, everybody has, a, has some kind of skills, something that they're bringing in and uh, makes for a um, a, a, a unit of people who are, uh, like I said, like a corp corporate unit, meaning a group of people that uh, help each other get by. Um, so there's that aspect to what I would consider the the perfect coon related to that. Um, there's todai investment in the perfect kun. There's commitment in the perfect kun. And you know what I mean by that? Like I remember when I was 12 years old and I was involved with Holmstrom's Kung Fu. You know, 12 to 18. Every time I show up, and it was just his garage. That was our kun in his garage for a long time. Then we moved into a uh, into a health club. And they at one time uh, opened opened a, a separate school uh, in a building, but <clears throat> you know when you come in, um, I used to have to sweep the floor, and it's part of showing you that as a todai that you're responsible for that coolant as well. Um, you know the dojo that I that I. Uh, uh, and part of now at the at the Goha Kukai Dojo, um, there are uh, uh, shoe shelves that I've made because I had some woodworking skill, and so uh, since they asked me, can you make me some shelves for people when they come in to put their shoes on? So I made uh, three nice sets of shelves. Um, but, you know, say for instance, um, the Kuhn, there's a new piece of equipment that everybody wants to work with, um, and that piece of equipment is $2,000. Given how, um, little money often a kun is surviving off of, 
Um, it's a hardship, in a sense, for the Sifu to make that investment in that piece of equipment. But it's not a hardship to pool a bunch of money between the Todai. And Todai should be should be conscious of this. Um, you know, if you hear the Sifu talking about a certain something that he'd like for the Kuhn, in the perfect Kuhn, Todai would catch that and they would work it among themselves to pool the money to make that investment. Um, that's it's part of the relationality, but more than that, it, it speaks to commitment of the Todai toward the Kuhn. Um, other things I think are involved in the perfect Kuhn is you have to have a really clear core principle or principles, um, the theory of the Kuhn, the guiding principle that's going to foster a continuous positive and healthy development in the in the Todai. And without those really clear core principles, then um, then things are scattered, right? And people people aren't always sure what is the kind of almost like the moral or ethical or important purpose behind their work in that particular kuhn. Um, another aspect, you know, in the same way that the todai should be invested in the kuhn and committed to it, um, the sifu should be invested in the todai on a fairly personal level. And so the Sifu should um, get to know the Torai at that, at that fairly personal level so that he's able to assist them in their development, you know, by, by suggesting appropriate challenges. Um, every, every Torai is going to be different. Um, they're going to have different things that they're working on in their lives. They're going to have um, different abilities. Uh, every, every person is different is what it comes down to. But if the ideal is to, is that uh, we're all working towards, say, you know, say we identify a core principle of FMK as being uh, the healthy development of the body, mind, and spirit. Well, if that's if that's a core principle we're working on, then a Sifu should be aware of uh, Todai's on his, a personal level to the extent that they'd be able to identify. Um, where work needs to be done in all of those areas not just the body but also the mind not just the mind but maybe the spirit and I've got I've got some ideas on spirit that I'm going to talk about um, in a few minutes maybe we'll just switch there now it's so one of the other questions is what can be improved and um, this goes directly to the issue of mind, body, body, mind, spirit. I mean, this is, um, in terms of core principles, I guess, uh, in, in FMK, and maybe, uh, maybe, I'll, you know, talk about it a little bit as modern Kung Fu. Um, so it's Freddy's modern Kung Fu, but I think it's been very, made very clear in various ways that, um, that Freddy's modern kung fu is is Sifu Freddy's expression. Um, but I think there can be something that we can look at 
as as modern kung fu as a as a um, as a nexus that everybody who's participating in this um, can agree on um, can agree on as a principle and I see part of that in the bow you know in our bow we have body mind and spirit and so a lot of the work um, that is, is represented presently is body work I mean uh, in terms of the in terms of the uh, material that's available for study and consideration on um, the FMK YouTube channel there's a lot of stuff that deals with the mind there's a lot of stuff that deals with the uh, spirit uh, but in terms of the the direct training in the Kuhn, um it's more focused on the body than anything else and I think there needs to be uh, perhaps consideration for the uh, uh, balance of training in these areas as well um, you know, one of the things I guess that I didn't say about the perfect kun is that it should pervade, you know, your work there should pervade your life. It shouldn't just be something that you do when you go in the kun, but the kun is kind of a place to go into um, where you're working on um, some of the physical stuff directly. But you're also sharing some of the some of the mind stuff and some of the some of the spirit stuff and um, mind and spirit stuff. A lot of times it can't be worked on as a in a group in a group way, uh, but it could be worked in in partnerships and tandems with people. Um, and, and I'll get to that. But in any case. Take your take mind, body, and spirit. The the healthy development of mind, body, and spirit as a principle underlying modern kung fu. Um, this is no different than what's underlying kung fu in ancient ways. Um, but you know, in some respects, you might say that we have. Uh, a new context today and so it has to be brought forward it has to be brought forward in in, in positive ways um, it's not being brought forward in positive ways right now um, in the mainstream <clears throat> so you have people for instance that have um, that are claiming martial art and they have very healthy bodies but their mind their their mind is not healthy um, because they're focused on competition, they're focused on personal glories, um, they're focused on violence, hurting people, um, they're focused on how much better they can be than somebody else, they're focused on all of these things that show that their mind is not healthy even though their body might be very healthy and to me you know then that's not kung fu and it's not martial art so um, in a in a modern martial art you have to have a, a healthy balance of this stuff so you can have a healthy body without having a healthy mind you can also get a healthy body without practicing martial art um, that's where Zen fitness comes in. Uh, I don't think, on the other hand, that you can have a healthy mind, completely healthy mind, without having a healthy body. So it works one way different than the other, right? Um, you can develop the healthiest body, but your mind can be really troubled. Um, but you can't develop a completely healthy mind without developing a healthy body and the reason I think that is because I feel like people 
if if someone has a really healthy mind then they have a really strong respect for their lives and 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 the lives of others which means they're going to be concerned about the health of body as well if if they have a respect for life um, so it's a sign when somebody um, who may seem very intelligent and who may seem to have a very good mind um, doesn't take care of themselves then you know that there is still something there that their mind is not completely healthy because they don't have a respect for life they may have a respect for for rationalism and intellectualism and academics and scholarship and all of these kind of things um, they may have a respect even for spiritual wisdom but if they don't have a respect for body then then it shows that they don't have a respect for life and to me somebody without a respect for life has an unhealthy mind um, so yeah it works differently one way than the other way in terms of spirit uh, my own perspective is that you don't have to do anything special to try to develop a healthy spirit. My own perspective is that um, we all have a healthy spirit, but that healthy spirit is fettered by unhealthy mind, or can be fettered by unhealthy mind and unhealthy body. And so, you know, I think as, as you bring mind and body into better health, then um, just naturally, uh, if, if mind and body are coming into, into better health, then spirit, which, which is always good, your spirit, um, it's, it's not fettered anymore. It's not as, as, as restrained and is able to express itself in the world in a, in a way that it wasn't if you have a he unhealthy body, unhealthy mind. So um, in terms of what can be improved, I think um, we need to give, give some more attention to the mind. Um, we, do, we do give attention to the body. I think we, st we need to, um, first of all, I think we need to maybe um, look at this principle of healthy body, mind, and spirit really closely. Um, try to understand it thoroughly. And then we need to try to uh, work on it, you know, in the same way that we might work on a learning a form. Um, we should work on overcoming little challenges with our minds one by one. Um, changing the health of our mind. Um, I have examples of body, mind, and spirit that I want to want to share. Uh, there's many examples, but I just came up with a, a few. Um, Kira, who uh, on the blog the other week I posted a body example with Kira. You know, it spills into the um, the mind and spirit as well, but uh, for those who don't know about Kira, Kira is a crow who lives in my house. Uh, she's lived there for over a year now. Early last summer, I came upon her and she had a seriously injured wing. She'd been clipped by a car. She had compound fractures. She had a lot of muscle loss. Muscle had been, tissue had been ripped off. She had tendons hanging out and I couldn't get any help from veterinarians and I couldn't get any help from rehabilitation centers and so I took her home with me and my wife and I um, patched her up and healed her and um, she was 
you know, of course, very timid. She's an adult crow, and she's not used to associating really closely with with uh, people. And so she was very timid, and she was also, you know, very injured. And I've watched her develop over the past year um, to where she's socially coming out of her shell, and at the same time, uh, she has a practice uh, to continually improve the health of her body. Um, at first, this practice was just kind of shoulder shrugs. She couldn't lift that injured wing at all. And uh, in this picture, the wing that you're seeing is her good wing. The bad wing is on the other side, and it's really more more of a stub, stub of a wing. Um, the feathers not grow back, and she's she's not going to be able to fly again. She she's never going to be able to fly again. But it doesn't mean that she stops trying to meet the potential of her crow nature, and uh, exp and and let her spirit, her crow spirit, out there in the world. So I'm. And part of that involves the body training, right? So she started off with shoulder shrugs and then uh, slowly was able to lift her wings higher and higher, including the, the wing that was injured, to where now, oh, you can, you can even hear Kira in the background right now. She probably knows I'm talking about her. But uh, now um, she'll do about a two-hour routine every day where she hops uh, up and down on this chair and uh, spreads her wing wide. Uh, she's able to lift her wing to its full extent now, even the, the injured wing. And she's able to even uh, get, get a, enough air that she can flap her wings a bit and do a 180 degree turnaround and try to land back on the perch. And she doesn't always make it. She doesn't always make it back onto the perch. Sometimes she uh, misses the landing. Um, but when she makes it back on, you can see the expression on her face, um, how proud she is of it. And even when she's exercising, you can see the, you know, if you know if you know Kira, you'll you'll recognize the expression on her face of how proud she is of the progress she's making and excited about it. And she just, she loves the practice, um, and you know to me uh, this is a good insight into what we might be considering in terms of the body training. You know we might not be able to you know depend depending on the individual, but most individuals. Um, you know, we have each our uh, different limitations. We might not be able to meet the full human potential. Every once in a while we glimpse some figure that's able to do really amazing things with their bodies that uh, show us a glimpse of more toward that full human potential. Um, but whether or not we're going to we're going to reach that kind of that kind of talent or anything like that it doesn't mean that we shouldn't still be trying to express our bodies to that full human potential and to enjoy the training and enjoy the little progresses that we make in that direction so that um, that spirit in us which is the human spirit is able to show itself and that'll affect our minds, that'll help us, that'll help our minds uh, in the same way that it's helped Kira kind of socially, she's coming out of her shell with us. Um, so this is a body example that I think is worth considering. A couple of mind examples. Um, one of the things that I thought about in terms of training that we might be might want to look at um, for improving the health of our minds is dealing with um, both what I'll call habits and habitus. Um, habits being, you know, the, the the addictions that we might have.
that we know are unhealthy, that we need to change. And um, habit tests being more kind of the cultural addictions that we have that we're often unaware of. Um, they're very, they're, they're more subtle types of habits. But uh, in any case, I know from watching the Philosia um, videos on the FMK YouTube channel that uh, see through the year aware that you may have a certain habit, somebody might have a certain habit and um, they might think that they that their body is craving that that particular thing um, or that in some other way that they naturally crave whatever that is even if it's something unhealthy they may they may think that way um, because because they've got that habit in their mind right but by using a little bit of discipline and um, doing something else instead, something alternative instead for just a little while, you can break out of that habitus, break out of the habit that you had before, and then you find that in fact you don't crave it. Um, that in fact, uh, all along that you thought that your that that your body or that uh, in some way your social person that you needed this that it was just part of you your personality and stuff like that that it wasn't at all um, I think that uh, just putting that information out there it, in terms of in terms of how to go about uh, you know just disciplining yourself to do something different and then breaking out of habit, just putting the information out there isn't enough. Um, you know, in terms of training the coon, I think we need to let down our our, our privacy guards a little bit, so that um, so that we can use the the family nature of the coon. Um, to help us take on some of those challenges uh, to, to break out of habits and every habit that you break out of you know is a is a good thing for your mind you know for instance for me um, there's a point where I just I told myself um, and I was eating lots and lots of fast food and I told myself um, I'm just not gonna buy this anymore not going to allow myself to buy it anymore. I started with one restaurant and then and then within a day I decided I'm going to add another restaurant. Within another day I added another one and I went on to like half a dozen fast food chains that I said I'm never going to buy anything from them again. And then finally I just said, well, I'm just going to say all fast food chains. I'm not going to buy anything from. And um and easily enough I develop other different habits and so now I don't eat fast food at all ever anymore I don't drink the same thing I did the same thing with uh, pop I did the same thing with candy um, where I just said I'm, I'm not gonna uh, I know it's not good for me even like pizza I know some some people like my body my brother's a bodybuilder and um, you know he promotes pizza as a good food um, you know, in certain times of his training, but for me, every time I eat pizza, I it does something to my stomach. I don't feel right. I don't feel good. So um, one day I ate pizza and I had that. You know, I just didn't feel good, and I thought, you know what? I'm just not gonna have pizza anymore because my body, you know, clearly tells me that it doesn't like it. Why do I ignore that? You know, and then a week down the line, think I want it again. When my body is over and over, repeatedly told me I don't want that. And uh, so I stopped buying pizza. Every one of those little, you know, little changes um, strengthens, I think, the health of your mind. 
Um, now I've got I've I've dealt with a, a lot of habits. I still got some more habits to deal with, um, and some and some pretty serious, like um, like I, I smoke cigarettes. I have since I was eighteen, and that's one of the habits that uh, you know in a way I'm ashamed of, but it's something that. I need to deal with. I've dealt with a lot of other habits, and uh, but I haven't got as far into dealing with habitus, and that's the next level. I mean, I think once you train with habits, then you can start considering habitus. And habitus are the little cultural things, the cultural kind of uh, routines that you get in. That when you really examine them. Um, they're not good for you. And so, um, I think once you've dealt with a bunch of habits and you can start dealing with some of the habitus, some of the cultural things, some of the very subtle things that you take for granted, um, it's just part of life in this society, but it doesn't have to be for you you can break out of it. So this kind of mind training, and I think we can, in this coon, we can help each other accomplish some very important things in terms of the mind training, because without this mind training, um, you know, we're not living up to what, to the modern Kung Fu that I, I think. Uh, another example of mind training that I think goes hand in hand uh, when we're when we're dealing with martial arts, is this competition, this competition thing, and the competition thing is almost more like a habitus than a habit, right? We a lot of times with it say that's just the way life is, you know, that's just our nature. We're competitive, or that's even that's just the way of this culture. We're competitive, and there's no way to break out of it. Um, I don't agree. I don't agree. I think uh, there's lots of good ways that we should be um, dealing with breaking ourselves of our um, habitus of competition and our habitus of trying, you know, wanting to feel better than somebody else. Um, one of the things that I notice because I do pay a lot of attention to animals, is I notice the animals spar. And when they spar, they're in play mode. Anybody that's owned a dog um, has sparred with their dog, or even with a child, the human child, has wrestled with their human child. And it's they're in play mode. They're not in competitive mode. They're not in... I want to feel like I'm better than somebody else mode. Um, and one insight I had in terms of the animal sparring was um, when I move out to the blood reserve here in Alberta, there's a lot of wild dogs, um, packs of wild dogs on the blood right. reserve. You know, they may they might live at houses and they might be uh, very familiar with a with a human family. And they're kind of like their dogs and everything, but at the same time, they're wild dogs and they hunt for themselves, they fend for themselves. They're not like uh, coddled and cared for like um, pet dogs in the mainstream. And uh, one of the things that I saw when I first moved into the Blood Reserve was, um, you know, a pack of these wild dogs, they caught a, uh, I think it was a rabbit. One of them had caught a rabbit. But uh, a single dog by itself has a really hard time, um, you know, eating an animal like that that is caught, a larger animal that can't just swallow right off, right off the bat. Um, he needs the help of other dogs to tear that food apart to where it's, it's the size it can be swallowed. And so um, what I saw was this pack of dogs, the one brought it over, and then they all took a piece, and then they were in tug-of-war mode. 
and it was exactly the same kind of tug of war mode where if you have a, a big dog as a pet you know and you have a big fat rope that you're using a little little piece of rope a couple of feet long and they'll play tug of war with you and they're in that mode that play mode of tug of war um, that same tug of war was exactly what these what these uh, wild dogs were using um, to take apart this food so it had to do with their with their subsistence with some real basic life needs and I think if we examine what it is that drive in us that attracts us to as human beings to um, the martial art um, I think down below somewhere we'll find something that you know it's very functional like that and it doesn't have to do with competition it doesn't have to do um, you know necessarily with uh, with hurting people or anything like that but it might have to do with something that we're gonna have to use in a collective way together at some point um, I don't know I think there's I think there's a reason to consider it but in any case when I look at sparring with animals what I see is a lot of it is play right the play mode there's a seriousness to it but there's not a I'm gonna be better than you thing to it it's play mode and anytime they sense that there's too much serious involved and the play mode has gone you know they stop and they kiss each other um, to let each other know that no there's that seriousness is not what it's not what we're about you know that we are we are playing together we're, we're not we're not trying to hurt each other um, so I think uh, you know one of the uh, one of the options we have for training the mind is in in the sparring in the sparring itself um, because the competition is a is a huge part of the habitus the negative habitus that we need to deal with uh, for modern Kung Fu. So that's another mind example. Spirit, like I was saying, I think spirit is um, spirit is always good. And I think it's a matter of making the mind and the body healthy so that the spirit um, is liberated to be itself, to be to be human being. Um, I put this picture in here as something to talk about as a kind of example. Um, I also want to introduce a couple of concepts. Um, the first concept is, is a Blackfoot concept. It's called Kimopi Apitsin. Kimopi Apitsin, uh, there's really no word like it in English. Um, you know, the closest I can really translate, but it doesn't get doesn't get really the right of the right flavor um, it's an impoverished translation is to say that it's habitual kindness is 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 uh, habituation uh, is kind of a kindness or compassion um, caring for others you know one of the elders one time told me you know it's like it's like you love everything like your child Give up a bit sin. Um, and I think this is a natural part of our human spirit. Give up a bit sin. But whether or not we're able to liberate that part of our spirit, you know, that aspect of our spirit, depends on whether we have a healthy body, healthy mind. Um, you know, related to that, I think, is th this looking at this word responsibility. Uh, which I've heard Osho say, you know, this is a very heavy word. It's too heavy. Um, don't do things out of responsibility. I agree with him. I look at this word differently. I look at it as the ability to respond. The ability to respond, meaning that something happens and your spirit is able to respond. Um, and this is why where the where the picture relates to this. Um, this was last winter and 
we have snow goose, snow geese migrate through our area in huge numbers, and I always go watch them. Um, there's gigantic thousands and thousands, maybe 30,000 geese at one time on a particular lake feeding around that area. Uh, they make clouds, and they come down from the Arctic, and they, they go through here. They're here for about a month, and then they're off down further south. And anyway, last year when I went to watch them, I went with a group of naturalists and with about, I would say about 25 people who spend a lot of time um, considering the natural world and paying attention to animals. They're, they love animals, and especially birds. So I went with this group of naturalists and we were moving at one point from uh, one side of this lake to another side in our vehicles in a little convoy to go to another lookout point. And on the way, we passed, and I'm sure that everybody noticed this injured goose on the ice on the edge of the lake away from all the other geese. And the injured goose uh, in that part of the lake I know that part of the lake, and that part of the lake is where all the injured geese go. And they sit there, and they, they eventually become either eagle food or coyote food. Sometimes their mom will sit there with them if they're a juvenile, like this one in this picture. This is a juvenile snow goose. This is, a fir this is her first migration. And when she came in for a landing somewhere along the line in that lake, she broke her leg. <coughs> and so she was in that area. Um, and she was alone, away from the other geese, and hurt. And we passed by, and uh, me, I couldn't even believe it that all of these people who supposedly care about animals can just pass by, like uh, like this goose and her life and her struggle are nothing, right? Um, so for me, I had to split off from the group at that point, and I, I had to go in and help this goose. Um, and it's nothing about, you know, nothing about a moral duty or anything like that. Um, you know, I just, I just uh, identify with this goose, right? And if I was hurt. And if somebody passed by me that, that is able to help me, you know, I'd hope that they'd stop and help me. Um, but, uh, you know, I didn't feel obligated in a way, like socially or anything, but there was nothing going to stop me from helping this goose, right, from doing what I could to assist this goose in her time of need. So I stopped and I picked her up and I brought her home. Again, my wife and I, we patched her up. Um, we put we put her leg in a little cast, and we fed her. She wasn't eating well. We even had to we even had to uh, tube feed her to get her strong again. And within a within a short number of days, she was strong. Uh, her leg was in in good enough repair that she was able to fly away. But this picture was taken the day that I brought her home and what's interesting about this picture is you see that I have a magpie on my head this is a wild magpie um, I call her Tawny and I've known Tawny since she was uh, a, a very young uh, fledgling and her parents who I also know very well brought her to me uh, to babysit sometimes they would bring her to my yard they leave her with me they'd go off and they'd um, find her food and bring it back to her. Um, but Tawny, Tawny is very close with me, um, as well as a number of other other birds, uh, including magpies, including uh, crows and others. But um, this is Tawny, and a totally, completely wild bird. And she landed on my head and crouched down, using me as a kind of a shield. Look at the goose, see what's going on. And, you know, to me, um, like some people have said, even 
some people around that know me around here where I live think that I have some kind of uh, a power, right? That I have some I must have some kind of a power that I have this life where I've got animals um, in my life all the time, and that there's wild animals that know me so well, you know, that they will be like this with me. You know, Tawny is not a pet at all. Um, she's a wild animal that lives outdoors, but she knows me. And um, the thing is, it's not a power. The thing is that I have been able to liberate one, one part of my spirit at least to be a little bit more what I would consider a fully human being. And, and once you're in that, once you've liberate your spirit in that way, then miraculous things that this other people just don't understand how it can, how it can be possible. Um, miraculous things happen because you're you're releasing that spirit, and that spirit is your true human potential. And I'm not saying that I'm totally a liberated uh, spirit, but I've got certain doors that I've opened, so that spirit is liberated in some ways. And uh, you see it expressed here, and you see, you know, a, a history of it here in this photo, and uh, what comes of it, and you know, and that spirit is expressing Kimapi a bit, and it's expressing responsibility, um, not responsibility as is mo known to most people, but the ability to respond. You know, when I drove past and I saw this goose. I had the ability to respond and nobody else did and, I, and you know I think it's because their mind is not healthy so these are the kind of things I mean in terms of what can be improved in FMK we really need to work on all these aspects of ourself not just the body but more more of the mind as well. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. It's one hour of video. I have several other questions I'm going to respond to in a separate video.